I think this is a good place to inter to intersperse some data um, yeah. about about women in in corporate roles and corporate leadership. I, I took this from the McKinsey website. Uh, McKinsey, as you know, as many of you will well, well, well know, is a um, one of the biggest consulting firms in the world, one of the most well known, and they're they're well respected. Uh, they have uh, conducted in partnership with uh, LeanIn.org, which is a uh, a progressive organization, um, so to so so to speak, or so to use the term progressive, um, an organization that uh, really promotes uh, rights and values and some of the good things that we are here in America. Um, so they followed 600 companies since 2015, and um, over the, so so and the, so I'm going to give you the data that they had over the five years from 2015 to 20 to 2019. Um, so there was no real change in the sense that being a female was a barrier to advancement. So women, were, so my interpretation of that is women working at these companies, there's a barrier to, female, to being a female and advancing based on that barrier. Um, and none of that improved in five years. That was the, that's their conclusion. Um, there was no real change in what we're gonna term microaggressions towards women. Um, and I presume that's the, that's, you know, when we talk about microaggressions towards women in the workplace, uh, we think about uh, flirting, um, inappropriate comments, um, uncomfortable comments, um, uh, even little things like, "Hey, I'm going out. We're going. The, the guys are going out for a drink after work, uh, and the guy, and it's the guys, and then you instantly feel uncomfortable." So there are th those are those are, I guess, some general examples of micro uh, microaggressions, um, and th th there was no real change in that over five years. And remember, this is the heart of hashtag Me Too. Uh, so th in the heart of hashtag me too, these two things didn't change. My, and you'd especially, you'd especially think that um, the environment around microaggressions with all of this, you know, extra corporate training and, and even just if you're, you know, if you, have, if you don't have two neurons to rub together and you're a male in an environment where you work with females, um, you know, if you're not that bright, you should at least know not to do any of this stuff um, because you're <laughs> going to wind up on the, the evening news. Um, and at the very, and at the very maximum, if you do have two neurons rub to, to rub together, you know that they're the wrong things to do. Um, so the, so the next point of data that I saw there was that there was minimal change, um, less than 5% change in women, um, and in women, um, and managerial representation of, uh, managerial representation of women in general. And also that, that goes to women of color, but we could have a whole other episode on, on minorities and um, opportunity for minorities in, at the senior levels of, of corporations and organizations. Um, the good news, um, and, and you know, I, I sort of mitigate this good news with it's, you know, it's not that big of a change, that there was an increase in 24, there was an increase of 24% of the companies um, in the number of women in C-suite roles. So 24% of the companies had an increase in the number of women in C-suite roles, but that number went from 17% to 21%. In other words, so their sweet, sweet, their C-suite roles were occupied, and by C-suite I mean chief executive officer, chief financial officer, you know, chief business development officer. Um, those are C-suite roles, um, and those um, went from 17 to 17 percent of the C-suite roles were occupied by women, and then five years later, 21 percent. Um, and so, considering that women make up like roughly 50 percent of our population, doesn't seem very uh, so. Something's wrong there. Um, so there, there, it remains the fact that there's a huge underrepresentation of women in these roles, um, and the case is that for every hundred men promoted, only 72 women are promoted. Um, so those are some of the corporate. That's some of the corporate environment and corporate practices that we can discuss. Um, so but anyway, back to Cindy. Knowing that data, um, let's go back to talking about Cindy because, you, I mean, this is and again, I, you, you're not. You're not just starting out in a career where you're looking to become a, a, a chief executive officer or you're going to become a chief executive officer. You were doing this in the, in the 90s and early 2000s when a lot less of this, um, this you know, I, maybe we could just call it, you know, sugarcoating at this point because if there's no real change and it's just sugarcoating, um, stuff existed. So what were some of the challenges that you faced and was it consistent with anything I'm saying? I think, you know, some of the challenges, to be quite honest, um, had to do with age bias, because when you're very young, um, I was a 22 year old um, and, and able to, to really make big changes. 
um, getting from the physicians, the male physicians in particular, saying, what the hell do you know? You're 22 years old and you know you, you know how to run numbers, you know, and, and instead of really looking at how is it that you came up with this information, so the curiosity to understand how did I come up with that information, I think was thrown at the wayside because of my age, because, and, and quite honestly, because I was a young, young gal showing up, right? And so I, I must say, Ken, I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I think I, I was really trained to do this. I was, um, I'm, I'm one of five kids. Uh, I had three brothers that all passed away as babies. And it was just my sister and I and my parents. And I'll tell you, my dad told me and my mom would tell me every day, you can do anything. Doesn't matter. Girls or boys, you can do anything. I think that um, going to an all uh, a predominantly female college also prepared me for that, where I went to a co-ed high school, but, but going to a predominantly women's college, there is no uh, juxtapositioning as far as debate um, with male, female. So when I came out of school, I was... I wasn't conditioned to look for the bias, but also it put me in a position where it allowed me to ignore the bias, even if it was thrown at me. Hmm. So I really feel like I was, I was well prepared for it. But something that you bring up, Ken, that the data resonates really with what is happening today, especially with this number of 17 to 21% uh, going from 17 to 21 percent in the C-suite, it's really the notion of implicit bias. We're we're great. I think today we are great about looking out for those biases. I think the one thing Me Too has done, although it did a lot of things, the one thing that I believe is is really primordial that it did is that it started the conversation so that people wouldn't be afraid to have those conversations. I think the pendulum swung in the entire other way and truly it made it for founders like me um, to go out and speak with uh, investors where I was told, you gotta bring somebody with you. I'm not gonna talk to you by yourself. So, I mean, that was real. But the piece that I think really I have noticed is this implicit bias. And the implicit bias is something that is just innate. And it is really challenging, even with the Me Too effort, it's really challenging to do away with that implicit bias because we don't often hear it ourselves. So I'll give you an example. Uh, my uh, co-founder and I were meeting with an investor and it was a female investor. So this bias goes, goes transcends all genders. I was meeting with an investor. We were meeting with an investor and the investor said, hey, Mark, you guys travel so much. What are you doing? Did he, so the investor said, you guys travel a lot, don't you? And Mark goes, yeah, we do. And the investor looked at me or asked Mark, do you have kids? And he said, yeah, I do, I have three. The investor asked me, do you have kids? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, how do you do it? How do you, how do you travel so much with the kids at home? Mark just said he had three kids. How do you, tra right, right. How, one second. How do you, tra you have one more kid than he does. How do you travel so much, Cindy? Mark, no problem. <laughs> we understand how Mark does it. But how do you do it? That's amazing. That's, exactly, yeah. that's exactly. Sort of like and, a bias Exactly. And it came from another female. So look, I, I don't believe that there was any malintent, but that's what I call that implicit bias, that that bias that automatically exists, that who's responsible for the caretaking of the children is the mother. Yeah, we, and so I am the mother. Now, I, I must say I'm very privileged. I am the mom. I am responsible for caretaking. And, and you know, that's fair uh, because I am. But the notion that there would be a concern, because remember, this is an investor that is speaking to us. The investor speaking to me, the founder, the CEO of the company, as far as how am I managing my children, 
not our co-founder and CFO. <laughs> This yeah. is this is the investor making a decision whether or not to invest. So along with those things, um, there's a lot of research also to add in to implicit bias when it comes to entrepreneurs and investors, in that they ask um, not questions of promotion. And there's tons of research. I'm happy to share with that. But but even the phrasing of questions where um, one is promotion and the other one is really defending your position. And so females get the questions were really you have to defend your numbers and males uh, get the questions where they're really promoting their numbers and so and that's not that's not me um telling you that's what i experienced i'm very blessed that they we have such a great value proposition that it hasn't been a problem for us but it is what the research points to so these numbers don't surprise me ken and i think that as individuals what we can do because there is there is a silver lining right i believe that there's no such thing as failure and you've heard me say this before ken i don't believe there's anything such as failure i think there are just moments that provide us gifts and if we think of ourselves as living through a failure we will sit in it but if you think of a moment where something didn't go the way you expected it to and you actually look at it as a gift, then you come out on the other side feeling blessed, feeling grateful for that moment that occurred. So going back to what we were speaking of, what's the silver lining in all this? That What's the silver lining in this bias that we're seeing? It's that there's growth potential. It's that the women out there, the parents out there have the opportunity to rise above. We have the opportunity to create a culture where we're promoting other individuals to come together and create a better experience as we all grow into our careers. The idea is that you can do anything you want to do and teaching others that that is in fact true, that you can do anything you want to and, and living those values, that's the silver lining. That truly is the silver lining. And I think for women, why is that the silver lining? Because men have also been compartmentalized. Men are, when you think of a carpenter, how many times do you say he? When you think of a plumber, how many times do you say he? When you think of a physician even, Ken, how many times does that happen, right? Where we just hear the word he. So it, men have also been compartmentalized. And so I think that it really gives us the opportunity to rise above, to create a new conversation where we say, you can accomplish anything, anything is possible. And really creating that, believing that for yourself.